I will start off, uh, what I plan to do really is just talk a little bit about myself, how I came to this, because I came to it, as many of us probably do as a second career, I don't know about you, but I, I started probably when I was about 31, which wasn't, I wasn't completely over the hill as I am now, but you know, I was kind of certainly not brand new. Um, a little bit then about the influences, ways in which I've actually learned, because I've never had the privilege of working in a big studio, and I think if I could live my life over again, I'd have probably been born in about, well, apart from the Great War, which would have been a trifle troublesome, I would love to have been around in the 1910s, 1920s, after the war, when particularly women artists working in the arts and crafts studios in those days, just oh, fabulous work. Um, so I'll talk about what's influenced me, how I've learnt, and then kind of a bit of a whistle stop through some of my work. So here we go. There I am. Uh, they say you can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relations. Um, I was born as daughter of an architect, so I was literally brought up in graveyards. And I could, I was good at finding a stone that you could put a tablecloth over for a picnic, no problem at all. But I suppose from being very, very young, I was in churches looking at windows, probably looking at other stuff too, but there I was. Um, and there I was a little later, this is 1976, or no, by the time here I was a senior staff nurse at Bart's by this time. I trained 76 to 79 at Bart's Hospital, I then worked at Guy's Hospital in the intensive care unit just over the way here. Couldn't find my way to that now if I tried with all the new roads, but oh. So that's really what I came into it. The big advantage of this is I'm not scared of blood which does have its uses. <laughs> um, then, of course, I had these, which were complete encumbrance. Um, you know, and a lot of us do have to sandwich life with personal situations, looking after children, pets, as you can see. My kids have killed me if they knew I was showing you this, so please don't tell. Lucky Steve's not here, because he now works with my daughter, who there, this is her first site visit, she's now the architect at Winchester Cathedral, so, you know, she started at an early age, probably following on family influences. But, you know, bringing up the family, ah, oh, that is the surveyor, the, my father, the architect, who's now living with me in his second childhood. So I've gone straight from being a working mum to a working carer, which is kind of good, but it has held me, it's held me back, but you just have to get on and get on with life. So this is me, the ultimate uh, compromise, if you like, my studio, mum's shed. So we shall go on from there. Um, that was, I, my first shed was 14 by 8, and then this one at the bottom of my garden, where we used to live in Harpenden, not far from, you know, just north of London, uh, was about 16 by 14, something like that, so a little bigger. Um, and then we moved to Shropshire about six years ago. I'd worked for the BSMGP running their events for many years and I had to escape to the wilds of Shropshire to get away from it. But uh, it did mean we'd moved to a bigger house in order to have my parents come to live with us because mum had dementia, sadly died shortly afterwards, and the father. So we all lived together in this lovely big vicarage in Shropshire, a fabulous place, but it had no decent sized sheds. So I had to start from the ground up and build a studio, which was lovely. They're never big enough, are they? You must have more stuff than you've got room for. But it has been, I've been very fortunate. And now the, uh, the you know, the good old Shropshire rain has provided a bit of greenery around it. Uh, but it was nice to be able to build something with a decent viewing window, you can see at the end there. Um, and any sensible person in the future could always, who doesn't want a stained glass studio, could knock out those windows, stick in two garage doors, and you've somewhere to park your Porsche. <laughs> so, um, inside, I've got basically two rooms, one which is led in. I know you're supposed to have somewhere for dirty work, aren't you? But I just, I try to be as clean as I can. I think a lot of glass painters wouldn't let anybody cement, am I right, in the same space? But uh, I have two ends, um, and we'll talk a bit about some of the stuff that I use a little later on. This is the only picture you'll be pleased to know with writing on it. Um, as I say, essentially, I would like to say I'm sort of self-taught, but I've had quite a lot of legs up along the way. Um, all the, these are short courses, started off with Penny Winton at the University of Manchester, my godmother, Auntie Margaret. Everybody needs an Auntie Margaret to kick them into uh, a new way of life. You should do something with your art, Helen. I've done art to A level, but then I've become a nurse. So um, at this point I had my daughter, I was looking for something to do that I could work from home, went with Penny Winton, who some of you may know. She went on, I think, to uh, run York Glaciers Trust for a while. So she was on her way up, but I think she'd just finished university back then in the early 90s. 
Um, and then short courses hither and thither, evening classes, odd days. But, but if you look at some of the names on here, Paul Quayle, a lot of you would know, the late great of the BSMGP, um, been dead some years, Pippa Blackwell, who used to teach at the Stained Glass Museum, I don't know if she still does. Um, Adele, of course, who organised the day I mentioned earlier in uh, London with Alf, um, who used to teach uh, at the Central School of Art with uh, Caroline. Um, I put in yellow the things which I kind of consider to be the most significant things that, are, that I've done. That, I'm sorry I'm, you're not in yellow, Caroline, the Central School of Art is <laughs> Yes, uh, it was interesting. I mean, uh, I did a postgraduate certificate at Central School of Art with Caroline. I think, Caroline, you've been the first to admit that by the time I got there, things were changing. They moved the stained glass department into the basement where you had no windows. The under, like underneath of an underground car, a car park, I seem to recall, was our outlook. So we, we were lucky to have been allowed to, to have that. We did. I know, I know. But of course, when they relocated to the new land, the new the building, land. stained glass department gone. Yeah. So difficult. Jonathan Cook at Swansea, wonderful. He's got, really got a brush fetish, that man. Yeah. Um, Kathy Shaw, who again, a member of this society for many years, sadly died some years ago in New Zealand. Um, Williams and Burns Studio in Shropshire, just near me now, and I, the Glazes Company, I had a, um, one of their further education, what do they call it? Um, continuing Professional Development. That's it, yes, a CPD, Continuing Professional Development um, Grant, which was nice, and I learned a lot. They are incredibly meticulous painters, their craftsmanship is second to none, but very different style to the way I work, but it, it's fascinating actually to pick up little snippets of information from all these people and then make it your own. And that's really what I've done. Most recently I did a glass engraving course with Catherine Coleman. Uh, fantastic stuff. She makes most glass wares, but actually to do it a wheel engraving, which you can incorporate into leaded windows, because basically that's what I'm doing, leaded windows. Um, so the things that are in yellow, and I'm going to enlarge upon all these as we go along, Alan Younger, who some of you may know, uh, again, late great of the Master Glass Painters, died probably 15 years ago now, a long time ago. And I'll talk about working one day in the studio, and I learned more in one day than I learned any other time. So the idea of working as an apprentice, just go to university, fine, but you need to learn from people who are actually doing the job and see what <coughs> they do. Um, Going down a bit further down the list, that's Alan in yellow, painted restoration and repairs, we'll go into that in a minute. Um, and then the BSMGP lectures and conferences. I have learnt everything from that really, just from going into churches. The kids think I'm mad being on a shower bank full of old ladies, but it's great, you know, that's how you learn by looking at one thing. Um, so, painted restoration. I'd had a kiln for my birthday and the phone rang and it was around about the time that the skids were under Goddard and Gibbs in London and um, their glass painter, was it Bill Smith, I think, yes. who was fabulous, you know, consummate glass painter, they'd that had all gone. And this chap, Steve Tompkinson, who used to run Tompkinson Glass, had a place in Portobello Road, would buy glass in the open market, repair it and sell it on to all sorts of places. A lot went abroad to Japanese wedding chapels, you know, where you can arrange your wedding to be in a Gothic cathedral or a French cafe or wherever it was, and they'll lay out the glass and fittings accordingly. So Steve was selling stuff in the private sector. You didn't need to be a, an accredited conservator to work on his windows. Oops, sorry. I, I have absolute respect for people who work in conservation. It's quite right that people have to be correctly qualified to get their hands on rare old glass. But Steve was bringing me stuff, and this is um, these are very old photographs, pre-digital, so sort of cobbled together from old, old photos. Um, but you can see the figure, the panel on the far side was the window as I'd get it. I'd get all the broken bits, and then I'd have to repaint, cobble things together to patch it up. So it was a very steep learning curve. If I did it well, he paid me. If I couldn't do it, he'd have to go elsewhere. But you know, he rang me up and said, do you paint glass? I have a kiln, I paint glass. Give it a whirl. So um, this is another of the same set of, from the same set of windows. And really, I quite enjoyed it. It was hard, but I did enjoy it. And I learnt a huge amount from looking at old windows. How the heck did they do that? Usually I worked it out. This is um, the drawing. This is now moving on to Alan and working that one day with Alan. This, these are the drawings for the three lights, or the three windows at the sharp end of Westminster Abbey that he was working on at the time. 
and just the central panel was made. The two flanking panels, the money didn't exist early on enough, and sadly by the time the money was available, Alan had died, and some very contemporary glass was put in, quite controversial, but there we go. Um, looking at the way he worked was just an education in itself. This is a close-up, now I have my notes here, this is a close-up of another window, just because I happen to have this. I think, uh, Ben, have you done a job in this church? Where Boldro in Hampshire. Is, that, is there one of yours in there? No, I think I went to look at this on a BSNGP conference. I vaguely thought it was the same as yours. But the way that Alan worked, I think you were talking about, uh, um, uh, oh, about the, what was it, the window that, that Bashan had seen with all the corrosion and grunge on it. And it's that corrosion and grunge effect that I actually love because that's what brings the glass to life. The surface, the way that the light is arrested at the surface of the glass, in, in most cases, there might be reasons, as you touched on, where you might want to see what's on the other side of it. If I have an argument, particularly an argument with Hockney's window, Westminster Abbey, it's because it has no paint on it. So the light is not arrested where all the other walls of the abbey are held in, the, the architectural envelope is held in by the glass-painted surface. Hockney's window is just clear lambert. You can see straight through it. You can see the pigeon shit on the other side of it. Um, but the way that Alan textured the surface of his glass, and there's a close-up here, you can see that beautiful, grungy effect. And that's what I tried to emulate. And he taught me a couple of techniques. Um, he would put a wash of paint with quite a lot of gum into it over the surface of the glass. And you have to experiment a bit to get it right, but a wash of paint with plenty of gum Arabic, let it dry, and then splurt it with water. So when the water lands on the, on the paint, it just dissolves away some of that gum. So let it dry again, and then you can just brush it with your hand. And where those little um, drops of water landed, your finger will just gently dust away that, and you get these fantastic sort of little speckles. Can you see little sort of speckled, grungy bits? He'd then get a toothbrush and he'd dip it into silver stain and go on the top. So you flirt the surface, the paint, unpainted, uh, sorry, unfired glass paint, flirt that with silver stain. So when you then, of course, you'd later conventionally stain the back of the glass perhaps to get passages of gold, but on the surface you get these tiny little pinpricks of gold, which are just beautiful, often with a little black tiny little black rim of where the paint has melted away to the edges. So that, I just thought, was stupendous. And this, when I was at Central, I did um, a panel, a, it was a two-panel window, actually, but also inspired by John Pat Saladi's flying carpet. I don't know if you remember that, done in the sort of 80s, something like that. Beautiful. But using acid etching, which I learnt at Central because I never had the opportunity to work in an acid bay before, um, and then, so you could get all these different shades, all the tiny little variations of colour in a single piece of glass through aciding, silver staining. But again, using this rather kind of grungy, gritty painting. That's a design I did for a window, never made it. The church, in the end, even the church changed shape and that window finished up being a bookcase. But had I gone on, that's the sort of thing I would love to have made. I've still got that one day. I might find a lady chapel that needs a, you know, a... a an annunciation window, you never know. But um, that's the sort of thing which I would have loved to have made. A lot of my best designs have never been made, because of course you have to con your client into having what you think they need. It's not necessarily the same as what they think they want and what they can afford. Um, so quite a lot of small panels I've made. I have done some church windows, which we'll touch on later, but a lot of smaller and exhibition panels. So I hope you can see in that, um, that sort of grunge and those little, between the legs of the chicken, I think you can see some of the little specks of silver stain that have splurted onto it, and around the top of his tail feathers as well, it's kind of, you know, splurting and a, a, a silver stain onto the surface. And then the poppies on the right, similar sort of technique. Um, so that was the influence of working with Alan and seeing his techniques. The next thing really is the BSMGP conferences, which I did for many years, I was lucky very lucky because you, 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 there's nothing like getting right nose up to a window. This is um, one of Douglas Hogg's windows at Joppa outside Edinburgh. And to be able to get right up to it, I also remember going on the Lincoln Conference and getting right up to, is it the Bishop's Eye or the one of the windows that at the time was like some, an episode from Joe 90. I don't remember the chat word wires coming out all over him. It was completely wired. The isothermal glazing scheme was wired to Germany. 
And a man in Germany would say, opens events, a little white, you understand, and, 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 and as they measured all these relative humidities across the window. Fascinating. But to get right up to these things was a real privilege. But so there's the Edinburgh Conference. I'm now going to take you through a few conferai, which directly, I had got home and I thought, right, I'm going to have a go at that. The, the window at the top left, that one, is in Jesus College, Cambridge. And it's a lot of uh, Morrison Company fruit and veg. I absolutely love it. I'm not so good at the figure. I shall see a bit later. But fruit and veg, birds, things like that, I just love. And so shortly after coming back from that conference, the window on the right is a detailed, a tall, slim panel, just in a front door somewhere in Hertfordshire. Um, but you can see, hopefully, the influence of that, the lovely turn of the thing. And then two more honeysuckles I've done, including the one in the centre, which was from the most recent exhibition. I have to say I knocked that out in a weekend because I thought, oh, exhibition, I haven't done it. And it's perhaps the honeysuckles in the one I did a few years ago were somewhat better. But I've kind of, for me, it's about the lead and the pattern. Pattern, when I design, pattern comes first, and then the veils of colour get put over it almost later. They're probably in the back of your mind as you're planning something. But I do like quite graphic, um, uh, stylized, if you like, pattern making in the leaves, which is what I've done in both those two. One was a commission for a house again in Hertfordshire, where we used to live, and then the exhibition panel, even more sort of clean cut. Um, this was Harry Clark and the Honan Chapel on the Cork Conference. If you've not been, you have to go. It's just staggering. I mean, there are um, Harry Clark windows. I think, um, Andrew, you took people down to see the one. Where's the, the nearest Harry Clark? Oh, the Ashdown Hotels. Yes, yes, just south of... Yeah. But to see that, every inch is covered in pattern and just beautiful. I mean, it really is carving with light. You know, you just put the paint over it and it's all scratched and, oh, fantastic. So after that, and this looks a bit of a poultry compared to that really, but um, this was a window I made, again, it's about, it's three panels. It's probably about as wide as from that window to that and about that high. So it was a series. It was a school, St Hilda's school. St Hilda, her emblem is the seagull. So seagulls, fishing nets, um, kind of breaking waves and so on. So that, and again, you can see the Allen grunge, you can see the speckles of silver stain, but that kind of all over pattern that Harry Clark, that was kind of the thing that really stimulated me to get me going. Also, and it's worth just mentioning here, a lot of these late great people that we'd love to have taught us all dead, which is inconvenient, um, but they did leave behind books and I've got three, but well, there's four books I would definitely say, if you're setting out, you should get. Christopher Wall, Stained Glass Work, Arts and Crafts Handbook. I didn't bring a copy because I thought, oh, they'll have one at Glazes. They do, they've got two copies out there, but it's locked till lunchtime. But just a fantastic, personal, and it's bedtime reading. It's so beautifully written, you know, so if you might like to take, you might do it. It's just an Edwardian gentleman teaching his students. Fantastic, really lovely thing to have. Um, the one I was going to mention with regard to this, actually, probably the most recent, which is Patrick Wrenchin's book, The Technique of Stained Glass, which is interesting. I mean, he would really, I, I was never actually, never um, was taught by him, but people who were said he was fascinating, the way he would just splash paint on. One of the techniques in here was using a piece of um, broken up polystyrene, and then you could, all around the edge, that sort of, Splot, just little bits of Paula's diary. Quick, cheap as chips, but you get a really nice um, effect. So that book is worth looking out. You can get these on Amazon, I'm sure. Lawrence Lee, Pippa, yes. <laughs> little book, um, stained glass. Again, it's a handbook, and it's so beautifully written. You can read it, and you can almost feel in behind you, talking to you. They're, they're lovely things. And John Piper, glass, stained glass, art or anti-art really interesting because we saw some of the work that he'd done which Alf mentioned earlier um, but he started off I mean he didn't make the windows Patrick Renshins made his windows for him but they were a hand in glove really good working relationship and but Piper understood colour and understood the art form as opposed to others that we've mentioned earlier um, right this was Stanford in Lincolnshire 
where um, John Peckett of York, he didn't have English heritage breathing down his back saying, oh, you can't do that. Um, he would pick up the bits of broken glass and actually turn it into something that actually had design in its own right. It wasn't just postage stamped or pushed together and you can't do anything with it. He used those and it's just fantastic. There's so much of it. I mean, he must have had acres of medieval glass to play with and nobody to stop him. So it's just the most lovely, lovely thing. And I've inherited a shed full of old saints through my father. Um, most of it's Kemp, which a lot of people are very sniffy about, but it was very well painted and you know, you can, I think poor Keith Barley nearly had a fit when I said I cleaned it with a bit of jiff and a green scour. <laughs> Perhaps not a bit, a bit extreme, but it is very well painted glass and as I say I've got an awful lot of it, but using pieces of the angel in the top corner there, um, I kind of cannibalised to turn into that small panel, which you can see where it is, because when Kate and William announced in the Daily Mail or whatever that they were getting married in Westminster Abbey, that's my little window in the Cheney Gate, a lantern. So a friend sent me that. But it's nice to see old glass given a new life and a new purpose. And there's a few more examples of that. Again, Kemp, I apologise. Um, these old saints, I <laughs> know. No, it is, it's incredible stuff. I mean, you can see these same figures of saints and prophets in Dunblane Cathedral. You know, they do them in the four foot six model. Somewhere else, just even down here, they were very much replicated. But they're still, they were well made and they last the test of time. So I had a load of chaps like this with bits missing, falling apart. And I put these, I had four of them in the end. I did two pairs of windows. This is All Saints Downshire Square in Reading, where um, the church had been built with a, a frieze of Clayton and Bell glass that ran all the way around the building, apart from two windows just on the south side, where they had planned to build a tower. The money ran out, they never did, so there were two empty windows. And these chaps just happened to fit exactly into that frieze arrangement. So the Clayton and Bell originals there are in the smaller window at the top on the far side. And then I've used these chaps, copied, if you like, the Clayton and Bell style of... of um, painted quarries and borders and so on, but repaired and extended the Kemp glass out to, to fit the bill. And it just completes visually the envelope of the building. Now then, my favourite window in all the world. Um, this is Douglas Strawn at Forfar, uh, just outside Dundee, Dundee Conference. What a stonking window. 1914, it was a, a memorial to a local chap who obviously had very deep pockets. The sad thing now, however deep our pockets may be, I don't think you could actually make this anymore because you can't get the glass. They don't make glass of this quality and depth and you know, the beauty of the stuff that you are would have had to, to bite on in the 50s, 60s, 70s, gone. So this really, I mean, if you look at the detail in that straw window, and particularly that, the detail on this side, just showing you the Beautiful glass, beautiful gold pink streakies, just so intense, lovely things. But now it also shows you how, I mean, that, that detail there is just the bottom of the, the second light from the left, the bottom section there. The whole thing's probably about 20, 25 feet tall. So you can imagine how much detail is in that tiny area. Absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to talk now really about my work and as I say, the first thing is having glass. You need glass. It's like taking paint away from a, an, a, 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 paint, a you know, an artist. Without the glass, we can't make the windows. So you need to collect as much as you can. And I've bought, begged, stolen, borrowed, been given glass over many years. And I've got reasonable um, racks full of the stuff now. I mean, it's, some of it screams 1970s craft fair, doesn't it? Those kind of opalescent yellows and things. But, it's amazing, a little tiny bit of something really vile and vulgar, perfect, lime green and pink, yum. But so long as you use it in the right quantity and cut it small enough and use enough lead for the linear dimension and glass paint for the, the blackening and the, the arresting of the light, it's wonderful. So I do have quite a lot of glass. You can never find the bit you want, but uh, that's good. But if you're doing a drawing, this is from a house in Cambridge, I did a couple of windows for this place, which we'll come back to a bit later as well. But if you, that's the drawing for a, a window. And in order to make that, you need those lovely 
beautiful soft streakies and shade. Did you call them shaded sheet? What did they call it? They, I've got a picture of a piece in a minute. Where, the, where it's the flesh, but it's just gently melts across the glass, so you get this lovely variety of different colours. So it's not just blue iris, green leaves, it's all that that goes with it. So when you paint it and arrest the, arrest the light, gather it all together, and then get good strong sun behind it, it just, it really sparkles. Uh, that's a piece of what I, how would you describe that? Was it, was it, it was a Hartley Wood, or was it Fisher? Just a, it's a flash, but very, very thin in places, so you get that. I don't know, what's the name for it? Tony Benyon, I don't know. I don't know. Just, yeah, I think it was shaded. Anyway, whatever it is, you can't get it anymore, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, the trouble is, they'll say they make streaky glass, but it's tiger stripes, you know, the stuff that I've seen Lambert's, it's all just like this, and it's just too busy. We want something that gives us that beautiful, gentle gradation of colour. So this one I did, some of you will have probably seen this before, the exhibition that we did in Swansea some years ago. Cut up that bit of precious shade of cheat. I've only got a few of them. But you can see how you can use that. It's all cut from the same sheet. It was, you know, fiddling around, the dark bit on here, and the light bits on the top of his head, and so on. But then again, with the glass paint added, you get that lovely effect. Right, this was just a small part of a much taller window showing how you don't just have red, orange, pink leaves, but those, all the different colours, all these scrap pots, nothing's ever thrown away. You know, I mean, I actually do have a mincing machine in my studio, you know, one of those things that your granny used to make, yeah? You stick the glass in it, you put a piece of glass over the top so it doesn't fly in your eye, and you tie a jam jar on the front and you mince. You put your glass on the top and you mince and you get these fantastic fritz for free. So you're a bit careful what you do with them, but um, I'm not quite sure what their expansion coefficients would be, but um, it's just interesting. Nothing's ever wasted. Um, you can use mouth, uh, sorry, machine rolled glass. This is mostly made of what they, well, they used to be desag streakies, and quite what they, what's now is a cocomo, that sort of thing and some, some slight light opalescence. They can be quite interesting, and it's more interesting to use lots of different bits rather than just having a blue rose, which would be extremely B and Q. Um, I've dabbled a little with American art glass, the use of Euroboros. Again, I don't know how available that is now. Do they still carry much at temps that I used to go to? They had quite a lot, but um, you have to be careful because it was designed really for lamp work, so that it's very strongly, de deeply coloured, and you need a blooming strong light behind it to, uh, to illuminate. But, um, and it's an absolute devil to cut, it's quite brittle, and especially when it's cold, my studio was not heated at night, I walked in one morning, I thought, oh, oh it's a bit, you know, you can, when you ping the glass, you know, ding, 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 rather than twank, twank, or whatever that tells you it's going to be easy to cut, tink, tink, very tink, tink, so I thought, oh, I'll warm that up. So I stuck it in front of the gas heater, oh, God. <laughs> Not very clever, so yes, it, it literally blew up. There were shards sticking in me, sticking in the floor, sticking in the walls, and it was expensive. And then, of course, like Maureen Lippmann, we do it in all the colours and all the sizes. So this is um, in the lovely reds, and some of those fracture and streamer, um, you get lovely, just interesting. Really simple, it's a box standard LED light, but if you're using nice glass, it's great. And the nice thing with using this sort of thing is it completely obliterates the view on the other side. So if you have someone who's had a you know a motorway flyover put outside their window and they don't want to see it, this will do the job. You can't see through it at all. Um, now I think I'm talking now about design um, and where that inspiration sometimes comes from. For me, it's all about the building really, and I think for contemporary artists, you know, it's all self-expression, darling, you know, and all that. Which I kind of, for me, it's the building, what the building needs. And I did a window at a church, I'll show you a bit later, in, in Croydon, and I was, I know, was the cleaning lady, she was there on the top of the bucket, and um, she said something, I heard her talking to a friend, oh, have you seen the new stained glass? Oh, no, I haven't seen any of that. Where is it? There. Excellent. If you don't know that the glass is new, it in an old building, well, that suits me fine. It just fits, and it, it's, it's right in its space. Um, this was for a house uh, designed by... Um, 
Bailey Scott, arts and crafts architect, who did a beautiful row of cottages in Cambridge, you know, mere six bedrooms. Absolutely delightful, stories way, very lovely houses. And this was inside in their kitchen, between a kitchen and a long hallway. But the inspiration came from some beautiful plaster strap work, sort of fireplace, uh, fireplace with plaster work, targeting sort of thing. So that's where the inspiration came from. Um, it is a good idea if your design looks at least vaguely like the window that the client eventually gets, and not necessarily the case, but it, it's important because if someone's going to spend a lot of money, you need to be able to show them. So that's just a very simple letter of light, and I've done hundreds of these. But I don't apologise for doing leaded lights because it's actually, you learn so much about light and about line and about the structure, how the whole thing holds together. Um, so yes, design. And you'll also see there, I used quite a lot of toilet window glass. You see the reeded stuff in the little strips. Using a textured, faceted glass can be great because it just, as you walk past it, it really wobbles, it moves, and it's that, that lovely twinkle, just adds a bit of something extra. That's using a bit of Muranese, it's not the most sharp photograph that. Um, it's actually my sister's front door and I'm staying with her, I wanted to take it again, but the decorator has just covered it all with paper and then used a hot air gun to strip the paint around it and it's cracked. So I've been doing battle with Lambert to try to get the same 2 3 one clips, which of course they don't do anymore. So, uh, anyway. But using Muranese glass in there, the, the, the main frames, and it just gives that beautiful twinkle and sparkle. Old Muranese, much better than new. So if you can find it in a skip, that's great. But if you buy it from the shop, it's this sort of, it's really soft, it's just pressed and uh, not as sharp as it used to be. So all, never, if you ever see old glass or a skip, you're in there. Um, this I put in because one of the things we worry about is health and safety, and this is one of the issues I've touched on, these enormous windows made with painted enamels, um, because they have to be bomb-proof, basically, and you can't really do that with leaded lights, and if you talk to any um, conservation officer and they all want it all in, you know, single glazed, you know, mouth-blown, leaded, so on, but then you talk to the building inspector and they want it toughened up to 800 centimetres and blah, blah, and all these sort of problems. So this was on the half turn of a landing in a house knew where we used to live, and you'll see there I've designed a handrail to go in front of it, which they were happy to take as a way of stopping someone falling down the stairs from going straight through it, because the, 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 the height was only down about here, at the bottom of the window, so there's a handrail with bits of glass in it, which is the same as the glass in the window, which is just a reasonably happy alternative. Um, this one, again the idea is coming from the building, this is the old vicarage of Barton the Clay, owned by an American who used to own the Cumberland Hotel, the way you do, and he bought this place which had been roundly neglected by the Church of England for many years. It had horrible false ceilings and suspended ceilings and it had been used for offices, and he'd taken all that out. And up in the top floor he put in some bathrooms with glass taps, uh, sorry, brass taps, and it was all a bit, Ooh. But he wanted stained glass to go over the door up into the top of this beautiful timbered roof. Um, Downstairs, where they'd taken out the false ceiling, they'd exposed a beautiful strapwork ceiling, plaster ceiling. So what I've done around the edge of this, the pattern of that strapwork ceiling is the border. It's all made of scraps of old, somewhat knackered, um, mouth-blown glass, some of it scratched perhaps, but yeah, does it matter? Just using something that's got character. All these different mixed whites, what do you call them? Tints, so very light tints, please. And then in the middle, at the time, my dad was using um, on the, the side on that side, they found in the landing and the, the lapidarium, what a wonderful place for somewhere you keep all your junk, the lapidarium up in the Triforium at Westminster Abbey, they'd found this cartouche which was blind, it had never been filled in, and so it was used as John Betjeman's memorial, and I thought, well that's roughly the same period as the house I'm working on, so I'd spoken to this chap and I said, well stained glass, you know, we had a spot of discussion about the Reformation, because he wanted bright colours, you know, red, 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 red. Uh, I said, well let's just go, you know, more you know, ciphers, mottos, oh, we've got a family motto, you snooze, you lose. <laughs> so in it went. <laughs> I got out of the way when English Heritage came calling to sign up for Joel. Anyway, um, George Pace, wonderful architect, post-war, and he did quite a lot, I, I love his stuff. And he was one of those great architects that would design the glass and the fittings, the metalwork, the whole works, one of that last generation that would do that. 
And those uh, banisters, I sort of designed to go loosely with the window in a kind of George Pacey sort of fashion. His woodwork looks very much like that. He does a lot of this, you know. So it's nice if you can do something where you're doing extending a little bit beyond glass. You didn't pay me for it, of course, but that's beside the point. Um, right, acid etching, really important. I'm going to show you some examples of where I've used acid quite extensively in the past. I had to get rid of it when we moved to Shropshire. We have a septic tank, and I don't think the frogs and newts would really appreciate me putting even the rinsing water neutralised into that, so there's no, just nowhere of getting rid of the, the water. So away went my um, acid, which I used to use, so gay abandon. The stories, it's lovely talking to people about the way they used to use. I remember somebody, was it, was it? Isn't anybody here, I hope? She said, oh, I used to put it on the window ledge, and she was in a third floor flat. So she put it on the window ledge outside her kitchen window, and she went off to do some shopping, came back, and said, gone. Oh, <laughs> anyway, it transpired that her flatmate had brought it in because she thought that there was a bit of a breeze. <laughs> so, yes, but, ooh. So, yes, gone has my, my acid has sadly gone. Um, so that then enables you to use flashed glasses to get lots of different colours in a fairly small space. So this was done for a chap or an odd couple. He was um, a consultant psychiatrist, but he and his very Yorkshire wife, you know, um, was, uh, they were Anubians. So, and they had a house in the south of France and they wanted a, a thing of Anubis to take to their house, so there we went. They were very pleased with him because his ears were longer than his nose, which if ever you have to do a new bit, apparently is very important. But uh, again, you can see the grungy painting and the, but the main thing is the aciding on that. And then the, they were in my studio, they obviously have a thing about big dogs because they bought that as well, which was a, an exhibition panel. I'd actually made the BSMGP 40 centimetres squared but abandoned it because it was so dark that in central, and where we used to hang our glass with leaves outside, you wouldn't have been able to see a thing. But again, that was a lot of aciding using um, Brunswick, uh, 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 what do you call it, you know, the black stuff. Um, bitumen. Bitumen, that's the word, for the, the water. Um, that was just a gold, uh, a beige, beige on clear flash, but nice. And again, with the toilet window splits down the middle. And very simple, you can jazz up something that's not that expensive for your client, but you know, a little bit of sandblasting, and they usually put a wash of paint in it just to sort of pick it up, you get these nice sharp outlines. Uh, so I'm not terribly good at figures, not, um, these aren't my favourite, but for St Michael and All Angels, huge Victorian Gothic um, pile by John Luffler Pearson, absolutely massive, and all the south side had been blown out in the war. I did these two windows, Anglo-Catholic Church, so they were very keen to have, this was St. Gregory the Great, with the, uh, my mother thought he had a palm tree on his shoulder, this is the guy on that side, but it's actually the Holy Spirit whispering sweet nothings as he wrote Gregorian chant. He was the first person apparently to write down what had become, what had previously been an oral tradition. So on the edge of that, you'll see there, you can just see around the borders, the Gregorian chant, which was the Pascal something or other. An expert in the early music showed me what it looked like. Um, because the window is actually in memory of a chap from the Royal School of Church Music who was a great expert on Gregorian stuff. But using uh, the, the vicar, wanted the Croydon tram in the border. Well, I wasn't that keen on that. But we did get road markings in. You can see there, you know, it's kind of like the zebra crossings and, and policemen's things and so on. Just anything to get a pattern into the design. Um, this is. The uh, United Reformed Church in Herne Hill, which looks like the Electrolux factory in Luton. Um, it was an interesting building post-war, interesting brickwork, and inside it had a beautiful, the end of the east wall was all a lovely sort of sea greeny blue slate. It was quite an interesting place, big toast rack church, you know, these enormous concrete things going down the length of the building. But horrible window. So you can see the little sketch, this is my old studio, and that little sketch there is what we did. I had a very small budget. So we couldn't have coloured glass across the whole thing, but we put, sec we put double glazing into the rest of the plain panels you can see around it um, to make the building a bit warmer. And then I made leaded panels for the cross shape of, of those squares. And you can see the first cross shape piece up there in my viewing window ready for painting. So that's it with the paint on. 
And the interesting thing, these things sometimes happen by happenstance. A United Reformed Church, not the Church of England where you have to get all sorts of faculties and committee work and so on, basically the church decided pretty much what they want and the idea of the United Reformed Church, many people coming together as a congregation. So as you see as this goes along, that's one of the arms of the cross and again you can see Alan's kind of idea of the, using the silver stain as a paint on the front surface and firing it with the glass paint. So the fire's rather hot so it metals a bit, you get this lovely sort of sparkly um, metal effect. Um, but at the bottom there, you can see all the tiny little lines became little extra crosses, so it was almost like many, many small crosses becoming one big one, which was, you know, all the, person, all the individuals of the congregation becoming the congregation. So it was, it was quite, it, was, it wasn't intentional, it just sort of happened. And I thought, oh, yes, of course, of course I did. <laughs> and that's the after. Um, you'll see the black bit, as I say, we didn't have much money. And anyway, if you put coloured glass against an expanse of completely clear, as you'll probably know, you lose the colour. So uh, I actually leaded ceramic tiles into those big squares. Uh, we thought about having patinated copper, which would have fitted architecture into that kind of post-war feel, but it's going to cost a fortune. And I found these tiles, and they were big square things, and I kind of cut them up into bits and put them into there. And it kind of goes with the brickwork feel of the building, I hope. And on the inside, we painted it with dark turquoise floor paint to match the end wall. And if you look very closely, it says made in, made in Italy all over it, but just don't look that closely. Um, this was a little church window I did in uh, Downham Market for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Um, don't quite know why I put this in. It's kind of vaguely heraldic, isn't it, Alf? I don't know. I've done a bit, but um, again, using... This was sandblasted, actually and using a ruby flash on the flames of that corona on the left and just sandblasting, airbrushing. If you can get a flash, you can airbrush and probably depends on the grade of sand you have in your blaster. But uh, you can get those lovely effects when you add stain to it. And that's the, the finished window. Um, a little bit up, more up to date now. We finished, we finished about for five minutes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But a whistle through a bit of teaching in a minute. This is now we live in Shropshire, in the deepest, darkest parts of the country. Now, this client, her, her husband, grows broad beans. So she's an artist, she did broad beans, and so it went into their front door. It's a, an old vicarage again, probably designed by someone like Burgess. It's really heavy Victorian. So they leaded bits around the edge and the broad beans in the middle. And then this, Caroline was involved with this as well. This is at Apothecary's Hall, just the other side of the river, where the gentlemen of the apothecaries decided to commission different artists to paint panels in a set of in two sash windows essentially so there were six 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 we didn't know who each other were we were given a few rules not that many I'm not quite sure I, mean, I, I do wonder if we'd have known more about each other we might have perhaps because some were enameled and very very light and floaty and mine are a bit you know a bit hefty but uh, anyway, they arranged them in such a way that the hefty ones were around the edge and the light ones were in the middle, and it's fine. But um, the, with the uh, all different um, medicinal herbs, well, each one, each each um, apothecary was given a to choose a herb, and then went off to find a stained glass artist. <laughs> which was <clears throat> yeah, actually in the end we were all well. I think yes, the chap they were all BSMGP members. I think they looked on our website, didn't they? And. Uh, Caroline did some, I did some, Mel House did some, Caroline Bennion did some, it was our last job, very sadly. And then another chap who, what was his name, the chap from the Lead and Light? Yes, yes, yes. He was the key to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, well he, yeah, anyway, but he did a lot of enamelled ones. So there we are, um, oh that's the final, yeah, Echinacea. And again using those lovely gold pink straps, I mean, you know, just getting rid of them. And that's my, I've just done that for my daughter because she needed a front door. But um, I loved doing that kind of very graphic, clean, scratching out sort of um, And again, acid etched, diff lots of different blue, blue on green, blue on clear flashes. Um, oh, and this was a little dabble. Um, this is in Montgomery, beautiful little, really unspoiled, mostly sort of Georgian, and probably older, a lot older, some of the houses, but basically a lovely Georgian area. And the, my friend runs this as a bed and breakfast, it used to be the post office. And the plan, the co again, the conservation you know, wouldn't let you do anything too vulgar. But they didn't seem to object to what building regs wanted, which was disgusting, sort of white plastic um, 
double secondary glazing to be put on the inside. So those lovely elegant frames would have had great white plastic blobs behind them. Absolutely hideous. So I thought we don't want to do that. So we got her chippy to make some very fine frames that replicated the outside and put double glazed glass into it and then stick on vinyls. Hurrah. But it works, it, you know, it does the job and it gives privacy to the people in the holiday let and it doesn't look too um, imposing from the outside and you get plenty of light and you don't feel closed in because the top of that you can actually see out fairly clearly through. That's roughly when you're standing up at about this sort of height. Mm. So that was a bit different. So this is me teaching. As I say, no such thing as strap. Um, the mums and teachers come to me and cut all my coloured glass into little bits and then children lay them out on a pre-arranged drawing and then eventually when it's all laid out big piece of polycarbonate sheet with lots of glue on it down on top pick it up oops pick it up half of them fall off no they don't um and then they, once the glue's dried they can be grouted so yeah that was done for the abbey school in st albans so you can see st albans abbey up at the top i kind of made kits for some of the things like squirrel rabbit flowers that kind of thing bumblebees and oddly when the dean came to dedicate this because it was a church school it turned out that the headmaster who'd sadly died quite young a few years before and left money for an art project for the school his name was robin oh. and i didn't know that it could have been called bluted it could have been worse <laughs> it was just interesting because that robin really stuck out done the opalescent anyway um a bit of glass painting with student oh you're a stained glass artist you can do something for arts week great um, this was a, a commemorating Charles Darwin. You can see that's kind of loosely a um, DNA thing. And I cut it all out, but the students aged about 15, I think they were year 10, um, painted, just very simple scraffito, painted all the panels, which was nice. And then I used to teach at West Dean. I'll probably never go there again now, because it's a heck of a hike from Shropshire. Um, but I taught there for quite a few years, and this is a girl who was about to embark on the Masters at York, um, and she came on the summer school to get a bit of an idea about stained glass, hence the Rose of York, or the, the Tudor Rose. Um, there. And it's so nice when you get a student who just gets it in terms of design. Very simple, weekend course, but you know when some of this is done, she's a, she's a tax inspector. But we won't hold that against her. Um, but she really got it when it came to those lovely clean lines. And that's, to me, that's the sort of thing that it's all about. Um, this was a slightly longer courses that I did there. Um, sort of summer school, it was a week, but actually it was about four or five days tuition, roughly. Um, the flowers were on at West Dean, and then the cockerels one I've just recently done. I've started running courses in my own studio, now it's built. So, yeah, that's nice colours and the final slide really just do you know how to anyone know how to do that have you ever done those those dandelion clocks no wet paint splosh tabasco sauce blah, 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 blah. which actually i think is a patrick renshin's idea because it was john renshin's who one of my students on this course had gone on a course with john and he said tabasco sauce it stinks when you fire it but it does that, these amazing patterns you get. So the point I'm making from this side is you never stop learning. And running courses, actually, you gain as much as you give. And the more you mix with people, talk to people, you know, that's really what it's all about. Because that's where we have to go now, because apprenticeships are nigh on but dead. So I think that's me done. Mm -hmm.